I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. We are currently in a study about heaven and the forever eternity. Today's teaching is Lesson 22, and it's called The New Heaven and New Earth, Part 6. The subtitle for this lesson is called Animals in the New Heaven and New Earth. Now, in these lessons, we've been looking at the place promised by God that will one day be our eternal dwelling place. In our last lesson, we examined the importance of animals to God. Today, we'll be looking into the subject of animals in the new heaven and new earth. Now, some subjects are more controversial than others when studying the Bible, and I'm not afraid to approach tough questions, but I do want to say that I take a very balanced view of things. We can extrapolate things that seem logical, but they do have to line up with Scripture, or I reject them. I mean, the Bible is the foundation for all truth because God is truthful in everything that he tells us. So saying all that, let's take a look at the question, will there be animals in the new heaven and new earth? This question brings us to the real heart of this area of our study today. As we all know, going into the forever eternity, it will only be the righteous people of God who choose God in their life on earth from creation to the end of the millennium. After the current heaven and earth are rolled up and melted away, God will be forming the new heaven and new earth. At that time, God will then come down upon the new earth and he'll be bringing with himself the city of the new Jerusalem. Once this happens in this new holy city, God will dwell with his people. Jesus Christ, the son of God, will then rule over the entire earth forever and ever from this new Jerusalem. So an interesting question that people ask, is God still going to have animals existing and living among us in this new heaven and new earth as he has done since he created our world? Or will he do away with them all together completely? Well, before we even start, uh, let me ask this simple question. Why would he do that? Why would he get rid of the animals? Think about that. Scripture says a great deal about animals, portraying them as earth's second most important inhabitants. God entrusted animals to mankind. And our relationship with animals are a significant part of our lives. And some people say that animals bring them great joy. I mean, I've seen the cute videos that show how some animals that were raised by humans and then were separated over a long period of time. When the animal and the humans are reunited, the animal remembers the person and showers them with affection. I've seen all kinds of, of animals with that, even uh, a soldier who had used a dog and they had a relationship uh, together over in, um, in one of the wars and they were separated at the end of his term and later on they were able to reunite that dog and the soldier and I mean it was incredible. The dog heard the, the soldier's voice from far away in the airport and broke away from the people holding him in and ran to him. I mean, and it's just like a teary-eyed reunion. It makes me get teary-eyed. And I've seen other videos similar to that. And, and I'll tell you, people have relationships with animals. They're friends. They're companions. And Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 says, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall dwell and lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion, and the fatted calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, I bring up about uh, the fact about people and their relationships with animals. Well, animals have been with us a long time. And a matter of fact, they were created just before mankind. And as I said last week, some people believe that, that animals were created, so they were here ready to go to be a companion for mankind. Now see, the scripture I just read, many Bible interpreters say that this passage speaks only of the millennium, the millennium and, and it does. It, this is going to happen during the millennial period. But others say it's, it's talking about the millennium and the forever eternity, both. Now, uh, there are scriptures that show both ways, and I want to I bring that up. So let me show you why. Here are three scripture passages for us to look at where the prophet Isaiah is looking towards the eternal kingdom of God on earth. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, 
and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Isaiah 65, 25 says, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Isaiah 66, 22 says, For as the new heavens and new earth that I shall remain before me, that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. Let me say that again. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I shall make remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and your name remain. Now, the first scripture that I read a few moments ago uh, that I said was talking about the millennium, that is definitely the millennium, but it may also be the new heavens and the new earth. Now, these three scriptures I just read now are definitely something that takes place during the uh, new heaven and new earth. It's after the great white throne judgment. So the descriptions of animals peacefully inhabiting the earth can apply to Christ's millennial kingdom on the current earth, but it also appears that their primary reference also references God's kingdom in the forever eternity on the new earth. Both mankind and animals will enjoy an eternal life on the redeemed earth. Now, why can we surmise that? Well, look at what Isaiah 65, 25 says in comparison with Revelation 21, 4. In speaking of the animals, Isaiah 65, 25 says, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. And Revelation 21, 4 says, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. So these later passages in Isaiah appear to be speaking about the new earth and mention that animals will be there and they will not cause any harm to anyone. And in Revelation 21.4, it says there will no longer be death, pain, or hurting. So comparing the passages then show it and says and speaks to us about the same time frame. It's showing us that, that there will be no more hurting, no more dying, no more pain. And we can see that, that the animals will be a part of that. Plus, add to the fact that in the, in the millennial period, although Jesus will be reigning in his kingdom and that animals will live in peace with mankind, the end of the millennial period on the restored current earth will end in rebellion and warfare. But in the new heaven and new earth, there will be never again seen any type of sin, death, or suffering. So it shows that that is talking about the new heaven and new earth. So it appears that animals will be a part of the new earth. Now, what about the relationship of God and mankind and the animals? Well, in our previous lesson, we looked at the importance of animals to God. What other thing do they relate about each other? How do they relate with each other? How do animals, how do men, and how do God all relate together? Well, something interesting that the Bible points out is that animals praise God. Now, we praise God. We do it from the joy of our heart, and, and we love God, and we praise him. Well, look at what it says here, that animals also praise God. And it doesn't say how they do it, but it does say that they do it. Now, when we read Psalms 148, it talks about the angels and the host of heaven, the sea creatures, the beasts, and all the livestock, the creeping things, the flying birds, the rulers of the earth, the men and women, the youth and the children, all praise the Lord. Psalms 156 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now notice it doesn't say just mankind, but it says everything that has breath. And you can't say that that's just talking about mankind because animals have breath too. Also notice in Revelation, it talks about every living creature in heaven and earth praising God. That's talking about everything. Look at this. Revelation 5.13 says, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might and forever. What is that saying? It's saying everything, every creature in heaven and on earth, under the earth, in the sea. That means everything. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the whole subject of animals praising God, but the Bible does point it out. And I believe it shows that animals have some type of relationship with God that we don't fully understand. I know I don't. I'm sure that you, none of us probably do. 
because God is so much more than we can ever think or imagine. I say that a lot because the reason is we can't imagine it. Our minds are so finite compared to his infinite love and mercy. I mean, we know from reading the Bible that God uses animals to fulfill his purposes. I mean, God cares about the welfare of his animals and holds us accountable for them. We see in Numbers 22 that Balaam's donkey saved his life. I mean, it appears that animals can have thoughts and feelings and can respond to the reality of the spiritual realm that people don't usually see. I mean, I've heard of dogs and other animals reacting to knowing something was going to happen like an earthquake or something before it happens. And they're in tune with the spirit world in a lot of ways too because they see things that we don't. Balaam was on his way. Think about this. He was on his way to curse Israel in exchange for money when God sends an angel to stop him. The donkey sees the angel, but Balaam doesn't. So the donkey turns away from the angel, and then it veers against the wall, and then finally lays down under Balaam. Three times this happens altogether when this was taking place, and all three times Balaam beats the poor creature. <laughs> then something interesting happens in Numbers 22, 28 through 30. In Numbers 22, 28 through 30, it says, Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, because you've made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand for then I would kill you. Well, the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And then he said, no. Then God opens Balaam's eyes and he sees the angel and the angel standing there with the sword. And the angel tells Balaam that if his donkey did something for him, uh, why did he beat the, the animal? I mean, he says that this donkey saved his life because if the donkey had not stopped, the angel would have killed Balaam and not the donkey. He would have spared the donkey. I mean, <laughs> you think of this. Here, this donkey, this poor little animal is trying to protect his master and he gets beat for it. Well, this is an interesting side note to make because I'll tell you, scholars who believe that before the curse fell on the earth itself, that animals may have been able to speak. Now, I'm not saying that, that they all did, but think of this. Genesis 3, 1 says, And now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? The term more crafty suggests that some of the other animals may have been crafty as well. We don't know that, but it's a suggestion by some scholars. Animals were probably much smarter than we imagined, and the intelligent animals that are around us today, are, you know, they, they're but a remnant of what they once were. So some say that Satan possessed the serpent. Others say that Satan directed the serpent in what to say. But the text doesn't say either way, but we know it was Satan behind it. It was his hand was in it. So the serpent's intelligence was demonstrated in its reasoning and its pervasive speech. His speech. Uh, in other words, is very persuasive. In his speech, he tells them uh, that, hey, look, uh, did God really say this? He's trying to reason with her. But the fact that he spoke through an animal in the Garden of Eden suggests that the animal had the capacity to speak. I mean, there's no hint in the scripture that Eve was surprised to hear the animal speak, indicating that other animals may have spoken at the same time while they were all in the Garden of Eden. Now, in Revelation 8.13, in John's vision of heaven, he says, Then I looked and heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. And it said, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of other trumpets and the three angels are about to blow. See, there's no reason given to think that this is figurative language. So most likely it is to be in, interpreted literally. And John hears a real eagle crying out. So we may see animals speaking in the new heaven and new earth. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. There's nothing that says that God can't do that. When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses and told him about how the Sabbath day was to be a day of rest, where mankind and the animals should rest and not do any work. Now, I, I thought about this because, you know, animals need rest too. They get tired. They get worn out. 
And, and I think of animals that have uh, some kind of emotion or they look at you and it almost seems like they can understand you because they can do things that you tell them to do, they will do. So there is some intelligence there, but they get tired as well as mankind. So Moses is told to give the Sabbath day for man, but also to rest the animals. In the book of Jonah, we see that God used a great fish to swallow Jonah for three days and nights until he repented of running away from God's command to do his work in warning Nineveh of their coming destruction. And then he had the great fish cough Jonah up on the shore to continue his work. So see, God uses animals in different ways. He used an animal where it warned um, uh, Balaam of the coming disaster. He's using Jonah. He's using uh, different ones that like Elijah. You know, he used ravens to feed Elijah in 1 Kings 17. And Jesus told Peter to cast a line into the Sea of Galilee to catch a particular fish that God had prepared specifically to have a coin in its mouth that would pay the tax for Jesus and Peter in Matthew 17, 27. Now in 2 Samuel 12, 3, the Bible shows us that lambs were also used sometimes for pets. We see in 2 Samuel 12, 3, it says, the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he bought, brought it up and grew up with him and all of his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now understand this. This was Nathan the prophet talking to David the king and about his sin, and he was using this lamb as an example. But it shows us also we can understand that people use lambs as pets. Some people love them and raise them with their children as a family pet. And of course, God uses a lamb to signify the importance of redemption. I mean, their value in being used as a sacrifice reveals sin's horror and the exorbitant cost of redemption. And so many lambs were sacrificed in Israel's history. And we find that those lambs, were, were, they weren't cheap. I mean, they were something that they were raised specifically for what they were going to use them for. And they were sacrificed. But it's the symbol of Christ, the innocent lamb. That could have, that's like a, a pet. Uh, that Now, God, Jesus isn't a pet. But understand the analogy that, that he used that as the sacrificial lamb. But his sacrifice was once and for all. Now, Proverbs 12.10 tells us the righteous people care about the lives of animals. God created us to be stewards of his animals because he loved them. He created them. He loves us because he wants us to love him back, but he also created them because he loves them. Remember, God created them and they are his, as it tells us in Psalms 50, verses 10 through 11. Now, he holds us accountable for how we treat them. In the Garden of Eden, God directed Adam to name his wife and the animals in Genesis 2, 19 to 20, but he didn't instruct him to name the plants, just his wife and the animals. The process of naming involves a personal relationship with all that Adam named. Since God had these animals living with mankind during the whole time, we've been here on the current earth, think about it, from creation, and they will be there till the end of the millennium, and most likely in heaven as well. We, we, these are, that's something that we, we can see with the horses and the eagle. Well, if that's true, then and, and I believe the Bible is true, then it's logical to assume that God will continue this pattern and allow all these animals and creatures to continue to live with us in the coming new heaven and new earth. I mean, it's even possible that God will create new animals for our pleasure as well as bringing back all kinds of species that have gone ex extinct. Now, it's not unreasonable to expect that extinct animals and plants will be brought back to life on the new earth. By redoing his original creation, God will show his total victory over sin and death. It's apparent that the curse that fell on the earth resulted in some species dying out. But God's promises in Revelation 22, verse 3, says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. See that? There's nothing going to be accursed. That means that the curse is gone. 
But because the curse will be lifted, removed, and reversed, it seems likely that God will restore everything on the new earth and possibly many surprises for us. If God started everything off with different types of animals and creatures living among us, then I believe he will have animals and creatures living with us the same way he did when he did in creation. Knowing that the current earth is only about 6,000 years old from creation until now, and most scientists who are Christian believe in the creation record of the Bible in Genesis, then that means dinosaurs lived with mankind before the flood and most certainly were on Noah's Ark. And not the giant ones, they probably had small ones. If you go to the uh, Ark experience that my wife went to this last year, uh, you, you would be able to see all the different things that, that uh, they did and planned. I, I'll tell you, it's incredible. She showed me some videos and other various things, and, and it tells a good story. So that'd be something you wouldn't want to miss uh, not going to. You, you want to go there. But, but the main thing is, I want you to understand that they were most likely on the Ark as well. So through atmospheric changes after the flood, the, the dinosaurs died out, as well as being hunted to extinction. But it's not hard to imagine all the creatures of God's creation living on the earth with mankind. And I agree with the scholars that believe that the answer to the question, will there be animals in the new heaven and the new earth, is a giant yes. Now next, we're going to look at some, uh, something else that's controversial that some people get really angry about on both sides of the question. And that question is, will our pets from the current earth be in the new heaven and new earth? Now, we know what happens when a child's beloved pet dies suddenly. If they, think of this. Uh, I'm sure that all of us ex has experienced it at one time or another. It can be a dog, a cat, a goldfish, a hamster, a parakeet, Mine was named George, of course. Uh, I, I just thought that was a cool name for it when I was a little kid. And I had a parakeet named George. And one day, he was lying at the bottom of the cage. But it made me really sad. But it could be a turtle or any other animal or a bug that someone has as a pet. And see, the family may gather around and make a makeshift grave to give the last goodbye. Maybe they put him in a little box or just bury him that way or wrapped in a towel or something. But the words of comfort are spoken to the grieving child. At some point, the universal question is asked, did that animal go to heaven? Did my pet go to heaven? Will I see my pet again? I've also heard parents tell their children, now, don't worry, you'll see Fido again because he went to heaven. Well, adults often grieve for their pets as well, and they ask the same type of question, will I see my pet in heaven? And yes, it's okay to grieve over a pet that you've lost. I know I have myself. It's because you love them and you, and you feel sad that you don't see them any, anymore. I mean, it sounds like an easy question to answer, but it's tougher than we think. Because is this biblically accurate? Will they be in heaven? Do animals go to heaven? As I mentioned, there are many theologians and other scholars who've looked at this subject. This is a deeply theological question one based on a variety of factors. Like, what do we mean by heaven? How does one get to heaven? What will we do in heaven? I mean, these questions are natural. But see, in Matthew twenty-two twenty-five, 25, the Sadducees who didn't believe in the life after death, now don't get them mixed up with the Pharisees who did believe in, in the life after death, the Sadducees asked Jesus about the nature of heaven regarding a woman who had married seven brothers. But what about when it comes to animals in heaven? The question is, however, it's more difficult to resolve. I mean, when you think about do pets that have lived with us go to heaven? Well, the one repetitive question uh, through, and I'm, I would say that through a lot of Christians have asked over the years, and those that aren't Christians have asked the same thing, is whether or not do our pets or any animals go to heaven after they die? For the, for the people who have researched this topic, they have seen many different opinions on this question. Many Christians believe that God will allow our pets to cross over into heaven after they die so they can be with us in all eternity. However, just as many other Christians do not believe that any of our pets will be crossing over with us to heaven. Now, I once saw a large group of people leave a church when their pastor proclaimed that Fifi and Buddy will not be going to heaven. I mean, he just was angry almost about it. He spit it out and says, your pets won't go to heaven 
When they die, they're dead. And man, there, there were, <laughs> I said, man, I will tell you, there were people that started crying and weeping and got up and walked out and they never came back. I mean, it has an emotional impact. Now that might be extreme, but I'll tell you, it has an emotional impact on people that have a hard time handling that. I know we can pray for animals and they get healed. I have seen that myself plenty of times. I was once with a group of pastors in a meeting and this person came to the window of the office and said, can you pray for my dog? I'm taking him to the vet and they're gonna take him down because he has cancer and he's dying. So the, so the senior pastor and I got up and we started and we looked at the rest of the guys and they were like, what, pray for a dog? And we're like, yes, come on, let's go down and pray for it. So they were kind of skeptical. And these are pastors. I was, I was surprised. But I said, yeah, let's go pray. We went down and we prayed for that dog. The, he showed us the, uh, the bill that the, the, that the vet had given him and showed that the dog had cancer and was dying. And he said it was time and he was going to have to go put him down. So we prayed for that dog. And we all wept. And the other ones are like, mm -hmm, okay, we'll pray. The guy came back a little later and he says, You're, and the dog looked sickly when we started to pray for him. The guy came back and he said, I, 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 it's incredible. I took him to the vet and the vet now says he can't find anything wrong with him, that he's okay. He took x-rays, did whatever, and, and the dog was healed. So if God cares about healing animals, even though you know they're, they're, they're just a pet, what is God going to do about that in the future? Well, let's look some more. So what does the Bible have to say on this issue? Well, the Bible says we only know in part while we're living down here on earth. That means that we don't know everything. And of course we don't. And we may, it may be one of those questions that we'll have to wait until we get to heaven to see what the correct answer is. But the best that we can do here on earth is to examine the scripture verses together on this topic and then make our own speculative guess as best as we can and then we will see who is right on this issue once we all enter into heaven. Now, the Bible does not give any explicit teaching on whether pets or animals have souls or whether pets or animals will be in heaven. However, we can use general biblical principles to develop some clarity on this subject. Now, if they did have a soul, it would not be like us. And I'll, I'll say that again in a moment. But what I do want you to understand is the primary difference between human beings and animals is that humanity is made in the image and the likeness of God, while animals are not. You can see that in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Now, being made in the image and likeness of God means that human beings are like God in some ways because we're ma he made us that way. He made us in his likeness. And he's imparted some of his types of attributes in us. Uh, and, and I want you to understand that humans are capable of spirituality, they have a mind, emotion, and will, and their being continues after death. The question asked by many people is, did Christ die for animals? Well, most assuredly not. not, not in the way that he died for mankind. People are made in God's images, in his image, animals are not. Let me say that again. People are made in God's image, animals are not. People sinned, animals didn't. Because animals didn't sin, they don't need a redeemer in the same way that all of us human beings do. And in another sense, Christ died for animals indirectly because his death for humanity purchased redemption for what was brought down by humanity's sin, including animals. They suffered because of humanity. And I'm not saying that he, he died for them to purchase their redemption, but because we are redeemed and earth will once again be redeemed and remade, the animals are probably a part of that. I mean, Romans 8 is explicit on this point. It says in Romans 8, 21 through 23, that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. See, this is a clear statement that our resurrection, the redemption of our bodies, will bring deliverance not only to us, but also to the rest of creation, which has been groaning in its suffering. 
This seems to indicate that on the new earth, after mankind's resurrection, animals who once suffered on this current earth could possibly join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Psalms 104 says that the earth is full of God's creatures and names several of them on the land and the sea. It says, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Now, who are they in this passage? Well, some scholars believe it refers to the animals who died and return to the dust. What does God mean that he sends his spirit and creates them? It appears that he's possibly talking about recreating animals after they've died. Like humans, animals were formed from the ground. Genesis 2.19 says, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Genesis 2.19. It says that there, June two, uh, Genesis 2.7 tells us that when God breathed a spirit into Adam's body that was made from the earth, Adam became nefesh, a living being or soul. Remarkably, the same Hebrew word nefesh is used for animals for people. So it's, it's interchangeable there. Now, it doesn't mean we're the same as them because God points us out that we are different. We are specifically told that not only people, but animals have the breath of life in them. You can see that in Genesis 1.30, Genesis 2.7, Genesis 6.17, and Genesis 7.15 and verse 22. God handmade animals, linking them both to earth and humanity. Now, I'm not suggesting that animals have souls. They certainly don't have human souls. Animals are not created in God's image, and they are not equal to humans in any sense. Humans continue to exist after death, but they, that may not be the case for animals. But we do know the stories of pets who have risked their lives and died for their owners because the animal's instinct for love and loyalty outweigh their instinct for self-preservation. It's notable for a person to lay down his life for others, so animals who do the same must be noble too. We have seen the emotions of hurt and affection, and it, it, even it seems a sense of humor in some pets. I mean, there are no specific verses answering this question of pets coming back to new heaven and new earth directly. Now, I'm, I'm laughing about the humor because I've seen dogs and cats go, they, change, they, they move their head around like, what? Now, so... Think about this. So I made me laugh a little bit. But there are no specific verses answering this question of pets coming back to new heaven and new earth directly. But if we take that pattern that we've seen from God the Father, and he's allowing all kinds of different animals and creatures to continue to live among us, as we see it from now through right up to the uh, almost to the white throne judgment at the end of the millennium, and if we go from one different era to another, Will he now go one more extra step for many of us who are close to our pets? I'll, I'll, and think about that. I want to. I want to point that out specifically. Have you ever had a pet that you were close to? My daughter, she Amanda, she uh, got a, a little cat that we called her Mink, M I N K, and and I love that cat. We had his love hate relationship sometimes. She was a quite the character. But I love that cat. And after 16 years, and she, she walked away one day and never to be seen again. And, they, and I've heard, I've read where they say that uh, cats will do that. And some people don't like cats, but this cat was special. And to us, anyway. And for years, I, I would like put my foot in front of the door when I walked in the door, you know, stopping the cat from jumping up on me when I first came through the door. And and then I realized, of course, the cat wasn't there anymore. But I love that cat. So who's to say <laughs> that God, in all his power, in all his might, could, could resurrect those pets for us so they'll be able to live with us in heaven and then eventually in the new heaven and new earth for all of eternity? Uh, I'm serious. Think of that. Who's to say that that's not going to happen? 
I've had people just so upset that there's no way that they can be there because they don't have a soul and they can't be there at all. Who's to say that God won't recreate them? He made them in the first place. Remember, God is God, and God can do whatever he wants to do. That's what I want you to really understand. It's not just the thing of pets. It's the thing about all the things that we're going to do in the new heaven and new earth. Here in the next week or so, I'm going to be talking about that city, Jerusalem, that Jesus uh, comes down with, with his father in, in to this earth, the new earth, and all the beauty and the splendor about it, and all the things that I've been talking about already. Who's to say that God can't do anything he wants to do? We can't because God is God and he can do whatever he wants to do. If he feels that pets from this life with us in eternity will make us happy, then who will stop him from doing what he thinks is best? Expand your mind. Think about that. We do know that God is just and that when we get to heaven, and then when we find ourselves in the new heaven and new earth, we'll find ourselves in complete agreement with his decision on this issue, whatever it might be. And, and I, I, so think about God. Think about how infinite he is. Think about how the Bible says that what we can't even imagine. It's beyond our comprehension of what he's going to do. So... Don't discourage people by thinking about and imagining what God is going to be like and what he's going to do for us. The possibilities are endless. Now, it has to follow with scripture. Remember, there's no sin. There's no death. There's no dying. There's no crying at all. I know death and dying, but I, 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 it, there, none of that. None of that's going to happen. So what is it for us to imagine that God is going to do something wonderful? for us when we get into the new eternity. It's going to be incredible. Because it, remember, it's forever. Now, I'm going to close at this point, but I want us to start thinking about what Scripture does tell us about the new heaven and new earth. I'm going to take us even deeper into what the Word of God says about our future home. And as we continue to study the new heaven and new earth in our lessons to come, I hope this will excite your heart and your mind and give each of us comfort in knowing that our future eternity is all in God's capable hands. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity for us to study the Word of God together. We thank you that you've given us these hints and these ideas and things that the Bible says about what we will do or what we will see in the new heaven and new earth. Expand our minds, expand our hearts, help us to become students of the Word that dig deep into what your word says. And I give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor because you are mighty and righteous, Lord God. We give you praise and glory. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today. It's a little different kind of, of teaching, but to find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website, in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter and updates and find out how to join us on our Wednesday night Bible study and Women's Thursday morning Bible study by sending an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So, until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.